Hey everyone, welcome to Telltale. Thank you, that's good to know. Um, thanks for joining Telltale. We are sitting down with Lisa Hitton. Did I say that right? Hitton. Hitton, who founded Queer Poem a Day with Dylan Zavango at the Deerfield Public Library. Queer Poem a Day is a limited run daily podcast series featuring a recording of poems written and recorded by contemporary LGBTQIA plus poets each day of Pride Month. The podcast is produced and hosted by the Deerfield Public Library. And I'm really excited to have Lisa here. Lisa is a poet and filmmaker. Her first book of poems, After Feast, was selected by Mary Jo Bang to win the Dorset Prize and is forthcoming from Tupelo Press. Has that already been released? It will be out October of 2021. Cool, that's exciting. And she has an MFA in poetry from Boston University and an MED in arts and education from Harvard. Her poems have been published or are forthcoming in New South, Line Break, The Paris American, and Lambda Literary, among others. She is currently the senior poetry editor for the Adroit Journal. And of course, she co she's the founder and co-director of Queer Poem a Day, which we are here to talk about. Thanks for being with me today. Thanks for having me. Yes, yeah, so when I first saw Queer Poem a Day, I got really freaking excited because I don't think, at least from my research, there's nothing else like it. So, you know, there are anthologies with queer poets, but there's really no forum like this. So what kind of spawned this podcast? So last year, we were just getting settled into the realities of COVID, and it dawned on me and many others that, among other things that we wouldn't be able to do in the presence of each other, uh, pride was one of them, whatever we might do to celebrate or to protest um, would kind of be gone, and it really upset me. And so I would say like in late May around then, um, I just, in, in the absence of all my usual rituals, uh, the idea of no parades and no celebration and no collective dancing was uh, really painful for me to think about. It's just, a, it has become such a special and important time of year. Um, so when I would be taking these long walks, I, as all times in my life that feel lonely. Poetry became my company. Um, you know, I would hear the repeated lines that always soothe me when things are painful. The same way I think that other people turn to prayer, I just, ever since high school, it's just lines of poetry that are, that find me and that stick with me and become my cadence. So anyway, so June, June comes and then of course, June changes everything again in the middle of COVID um, because George Floyd was murdered and there was a new reason, not a new reason, but um, a necessity for people to show up and protest. And so in thinking about just how original pride was a, was a riot and a protest and that there was this thing that even in a pandemic was bringing people out um, to say something and to stand for something, I thought, you know, how am I gonna, how am I going to, if this lasts this long, what can I do and offer that might give people some peace and some semblance of either celebration or just recognition of whatever emotional things are being upheaved as happens in, especially in queer communities and in oppressed communities. Um, so, it's a long way to say that I just started imagining that um, it was so hard to be seen and heard to begin with, and I resist the idea that it needed to be virtually, so I thought a virtual literary pride parade of queer poets might be a way to, in some small way, give back to um, this month that has become a ritual for many of us. Um, yeah, so that's sort of where the idea came from. I just kind of became obsessed with some digitized version of like each poet's voice is its own float in the parade and it's going to arrive to your podcast feed as such. Um, and that we're not telling you who they are first. That'll be revealed the sort of the same way where if, 
it, for those who have gone to a parade or a pride parade, it's such a fun reveal um, when these things happen in an order that you don't know and with different bodies and different means of expression. I love that, especially now because um, I think there are a lot of uh, maybe like queer poets or people that haven't even come out yet that, that maybe have never had a chance to go to Pride. Um, so this is kind of a really cool opportunity for other people that haven't been there, maybe don't have that experience of like seeing the reveal, seeing the parades, um, to kind of get something um, and, and maybe have some of those lines that, that you were mentioning that soothe you. And I'm kind of curious, what lines do you recall when you're taking those walks and thinking back and feeling lonely? Um, I think it depends on the moment in one's like mythos or pain or, or whatever moment I'm being met. For me, it tends to be pain. Um, I, lately, I think, I think in part ta in talking to my co-director, Dylan Zavanya, we both as queer people from the same community often think about poets whose work is taught that is not discussed in any fashion as coming from a queer person and how some of those have hung around with me since high school, even before I knew. So even just it's summer. So I'm often thinking of even Mary Oliver's, you do not have to be good. You do not have to go walking on your knees. You do not have to be good. You do not have to go walking on your knees. There are just certain things like that, that um, enter the mind field as prayer. Um, August is coming, so all day my body accepts what it is. Like, that's another Mary Oliver that I keep. Um, Louise Glick is an important force to many of us and um, was also my thesis advisor and is a very important human and her, her body of work is very important to me. She's another person whose myriad lines from many, many books uh, seem to find me when I'm walking around. At the end of my suffering, there was a door. It's probably the most famous one that we think of. Um, so I think it just depends on the spell and the moment. I will also say it's been so nice in this phase of my writing life to have friends whose books have entered the world. So sometimes it's their lines now too that um, you see on a page and that really stick with you. I don't want to give away too many of the people who will be uh, with us this June on the podcast, but um, it's very exciting. I will also say it to your, I just want to say it to your point, Callie, about people who haven't experienced pride. The other reason that Dylan was so excited about this project and why a library was such a, an important vehicle is it's a space where those of us who don't want to be out and loud all the time for any kind of reason can go and have the privacy of things like finding your private lines that help you somewhere on your journey. So there's a really, I think, complicated and compelling reason that the two of us were interested in having the library be the vehicle, even though we're sort of, you know, the poets who are with us are gonna be very out and loud and queer because we labeled it Queer Poem a Day. Um, but for listeners, I hope it offers that myriad of complex experience, whether it's joy or pain or figuring it out, I think it will find people wherever they are. Yeah, I love that. And I think there's so much, I mean, in poetry of the queer experience that you do find in private and so much of it, you don't really, um, I mean, a lot of people don't come to it um, by being out and by being loud. Some of them come kind of by being silent and by, by feeling oppressed and by being hidden. And so I think this is a really beautiful mix of both of those things. Um, and I wanted to hear, so how did you choose the poets for this series? You know, this year is the first year, so I definitely leaned on poets who I knew would be interested in the project, who I knew either professionally, maybe I was familiar with their work from a joint journal, um, or f familiar through books, but maybe I already had some element of connection through Adroit because I felt that that would legitimize the program a little bit. Um, just because some of the people who I emailed who have no idea who I am or what this project is, I either didn't hear an answer maybe or um, they were too busy or they didn't know 
really what what it would entail or what it would look like. So um, I leaned a lot on the people I knew, and I also leaned a lot on some amazing publicists and agents. I mean, we were able to we're going to be able to represent some really well-known names as well as just some more emerging writers. Um, for the first year, I would say also there was an effort at the beginning because the library is in Deerfield. I wanted to make sure we had some Chicagoland poets and that was exciting too because I think the the patrons of that library will be so compelled when they you know the library is open now so when people are able to go in and see this display of all these beautiful books that the library now has for them um they'll be able to see some familiar names from that area as well as just maybe bigger names that they've heard of so this year it was really just leaning on um who knows who i i mean i cold emailed tons and tons and tons of poets and some of them got back to me and some of them didn't and i hope that in the future years, all of them will be ready, excited, and interested. Uh, I would say our age range is also something like 20 to about six, somewhere in the 60s this year. Um, for sure, 65. So I, I think the range of bodies and voices and who I did know and who Dylan and I just hoped for the best and really were so happy to hear back, um, there were some elements of combination therein. Yeah, I love that idea. And why why else do you think that the library wanted to take this on? I know you mentioned Illinois come Illinois coming out with this new look curriculum law. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so it's very you know, the Deerfield Public Library is in many ways kind of an institution that raised me. I mean, my first experiences of being read to aloud were in the basement of that library. I mean, it's been remodeled now, but there was this special reading room and uh, parents, mostly mothers and children could come and hear stories read. And even, you know, one of my best friends from growing up who is a writer um, in theater and in Hollywood now, like the two, that's how we met is just in that room. So there, there's memories about a library that are really important to just hearing voices and finding books. The other reason though, that I was so compelled by Dylan's interest is because this is, I could not imagine that the library of my hometown in Illinois would host a program described as, you know, a virtual and literary pride parade of poets who, and, and by the way, in my pitch, you know, who turn a line as well as a queen can snatch a wig. So to, when I grew up in Deerfield, there were just, there were no balloons, no rainbows, no parades, no mention of pride at all. Um, I have some, as, as many of us do, I even have memories of, it was such a big deal that the Gay Straight Alliance and our theater department wanted to do Day of Silence. And there was a team of people who came in from a family organ, Christian family organization, Day of Truth, capital T, and they spoke propaganda all day while the rest of us were respecting the day of silence. So um, there, it is amazing to me that in the you know, 15 years, how different the place is. And part of it is because Dylan's there. Uh, and some of it is because he's also, he's gay. And so there are things that I think the way that we presented the project to the board and to the members of the library was just really earnest and compelling. And I also think that the this the Deerfield Public Library actually has had a reckoning in the last few years. Um, one Dylan's big project before this one was about the fight to integrate Deerfield and how James Baldwin came to our town and they built a park instead of integrated housing. And there's a long history and archives now that have us look at what what we've done and what we can do. So I think the library has been kind of on a roll with this kind of project of contemporary issues um, that a town normally doesn't get to deal with in a public fashion, let alone in an archived one. So these things will be permanent for us to look at. Now, in regards to Illinois and the new law, that was the other fun thing when we were pitching this to the library is that when Governor Pritzker got into office, I believe the second bill he passed, it's like one of the first things he did early, like first month in August when he was in, um, 
was pass an LGBTQIA plus inclusion law for history curriculums from K through 12 now, students will learn about LGBTQ plus contributions. And I think while that's really exciting, a lot of teachers might not yet have all of the resources that could be used or incorporated to announce that to students. I think poetry is also a great one because it spans different kinds of ages. So you could have young people reading works by Walt Whitman and uh, learning about that contribution to culture and to history. So I think the library was extra excited that they would have this educational resource because a, a public library is a forum for education among other things in their mission statement. This has been a already, we've been getting really exciting feedback from educators, schools, and other local libraries that are just excited to have something like this for patrons. Absolutely. Well, congrats to you. It's about damn time, I say, and it's cool that the Deerfield Public Library is, is excited about this. And I'm wondering, what are you hoping to see happen with this series? Well, I think it's already evolved into something far more substantial than Dylan and I maybe imagined months ago when we thought, we'll just throw this together and see what it does. I sort of now founded a little organization that's just called Queer Poems so that um, I have flexibility to think of other ways to create educational tools that center around poems and poets in this camp of queerness. I just think that there's, I think for this program in particular, I hope it runs for many, many years, maybe forever. And that it draws, I think once the first run goes out, I think a lot of other poets and a lot of other people interested in poetry will be so so compelled to follow along. And that's the great thing about a podcast is even if you don't live in Deerfield, Illinois, you have access to little bits of it that might get you interested. I also think because it's it's on a on the library's podcast, other listeners of many ages will now have access in a very palatable way to just poetry in general. And I am excited to see what that does to the physical book checkouts in the libraries. I hope that it helps, you know, for us, especially us more emerging poets, I hope it also just generates some interest in our work and in our books if we have them. Um, I think this is just a really good way to get teachers students and other people who are interested in the tutelage of the poetic world to the page and to the books. Um, my other hopes, I, I, I'm, I think it's too soon to know. I just think it will take the poets where, I think it will help poets get wherever they want to go. I think, um, I hope that people listen to the trailer episode, but also watch the visual trailer. I just think there's a way of putting all of these poets together in an order that also stands for something more than just an individual poem in itself. Similar to how people would think of editing an anthology. I just, because I have a communications background, the, this new media element of having it, you can go look at it on the page, but you're really gonna have 30 days of all these voices in your head, the same way I had 30 voices in my head, comforting me and calming me down throughout the pandemic, I hope translates uh, to listeners. Yeah, and what advice do you have for queer poets listening to this who maybe want to be heard but haven't yet found an outlet for themselves yet? I think of, you know, most of my mentors are substantially older than me and we're in a very different ball game where the vocational poet was not a thing and there weren't online journals and there wasn't the need to become a social media mogul in order to get your voice heard. So I actually find what they say comforting because they sort of are in a, in, in some ways it's infuriating because they don't know the, this particular nuances of the pressure, but I really do think it's true that you just have to worry about the writing and know that your best writing is always ahead of you. And if you focus on that instead of these other newfangled things like publication and if people liked your poem when you tweeted it out, which is so stressful and I can appreciate the, the, the stresses of that. But I just think you'll find your readers and you'll also 
find ways to just keep that best poem in front of you. So how can we follow and support Queer Poem A Day? You can follow along with us for the month of June at the Deerfield, at deerfieldlibrary.org slash Queer Poem A Day. There you will see the posted poems, the podcasts and transcripts of the podcasts. Um, you can also follow us on social media with the hashtag Queer Poem A Day or at Queer Poem A Day. Um, and you can follow the podcast anywhere. So we are on Spotify, Apple Play, Google Play, which I think may be changed to something like YouTube Music. That one's harder to say for you Android users. Whichever your Android thing is now, it, we're available there as well. And Stitcher. Anywhere you listen to podcasts, you can find us at the Deerfield Library podcast or Deerfield Library podcast, Queer Poem a Day, we will show up. Um, if we wanted to support financially, is there a way to donate? Currently there is not because the library is not a nonprofit. So we are working on that for next year in conjunction with this new fledgling organization that I started <laughs> called queerpoems.org. But you can support the writers by buying their books, especially from local bookstores or the distributor, as most of us have books from indie presses, and from encouraging your own library to get books by queer poets, especially living ones. Um, we are here, there are many of us, this is just a sampling of 30. This is why I hope it goes on every year. There are so many more poets that we would love to host in this fashion and whose books we would love to have in our library and in other libraries. So for now, I say support the individual poets by buying their books. Um, and in the future, in future months, I don't think by June, we will have a way for you to donate to the project so that we can do it again in June in perpetuity. <laughs> cool, yeah, I think that's brilliant. And so for everyone, anyone listening, feel free to email your public library today and suggest that they um, carry the books of poets you love and check out Queer Poem A Day wherever podcasts are found. Thank you so much, Lisa. It was my pleasure to have you today. And I know that everyone listening will be really excited as well. Yes, thank you so much for having me. And I just look forward to also the patrons of Telltale getting invested in this project and in others. And we're, we're all kind of in it together as listeners and readers, if nothing else. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you.